All right, it is at the top of the hour. So good morning and good afternoon, good evening to everyone that is joining us for the CES Artex Academy webinar. Um, we just wanted to thank you again for joining us. Today we are joined by Henry Collins, who's gonna give us a really great um, presentation. But before Henry goes ahead and gets started, um, just one quick housekeeping item. Um, we will be taking questions throughout the presentation. If you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A box, which is in the panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then we will be at the end of the presentation. Um, with that, the floor is yours, Henry. Thank you very much, Annie. All right, so uh, today we're gonna to be talking about if you're, uh, so you think you're building a barn. Um, my name is Henry Collins. I'm the uh, VS Artex representative for the Asia Pacific region. Um, I, if you haven't guessed from the accent, I am Australian. Uh, I live in Australia. Um, I've been with VS Artex for about four years now, having spent time up in China um, pre-COVID, and now I'm uh, back and settled in Australia. So just a quick overview of um, what we're going to be, what I'm going to be going through today. Um, starting off with well, why would you want to build a barn? Um, I'll then go through the various types of barns. Um, I'll also talk about compost versus freestalling, um, cow comfort. Um, so heat abatement, ventilation, cooling, all the stuff you want to do to your barn. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to go through uh, those various types of barns and look at the costs um, and the costs, the cost to build, cost to run, and the differences between. So who are we? Um, well, hopefully if you've uh, joined this webinar, you should know a little bit about us, but um, here at BS Artex, uh, we innovate, implement uh, intelligent barn systems to optimize animal wellbeing and drive operational efficiency for farms around the world. So. Um, my fiance puts it uh, quite well, actually. She, as she explains it to her friends, um, I'm an interior decorator for dairy barns, basically. Um, you build the shed, we'll put everything inside of it, and that covers everything from gates to water troughs, steel, um, and most importantly, ventilation. And we do ventilation designs and layouts, and we can talk through um, what's best suited for your facility. So why build a barn? Um, most people here in Australia, um, we're sort of we're well over 90% of the dairy farms in Australia are pasture based. Um, so a lot of the people over here, we're looking at the main reason they're sort of getting into doing barning is, is weather related. So, um, in summer that's high heat milk production losses because of it. Uh, and then in winter, um, because of damaged soils, which damages feed. Um, lameness, mastitis that comes from uh, uh, walking through the mud. Um, cow comfort is also another big reason. So as we, as we sort of talked about um, building a dairy barn, what you want to do is um, put a facility there that's going to improve your, your animal health, um, reduce stress. Um, and in doing so, you want to make sure that you've got adequate enough bedding um, you're going to protect them from the sun, you're going to protect them from the rain or the snow, depending on where you are. Um, and through that, you are going to be hopefully providing better feed and you're going to get a lot less feed um, wastage. Um, and finally, sort of management. So uh, employee satisfaction, has, especially here in Australia, feedback has been um, once uh, uh, employees are working with a barning setup versus a pasture setup, the employee satisfaction has gone, has gone up. Um, having a barn centrally located to a parlour, so it's much easier to manage your your cows and everything at a central site instead of going miles out into the paddock to, to fetch them. Um, using that land that maybe you were using as pasture before to really allocate for feed or use for other facilities. Um, and as we spoke about, sort of reduce um, feed wastage. And as we sort of say, um, feed feed is typically the, the highest cost on a, on a dairy farm. So the best we can do to protect that, um, the better off you're going to be. So building a barn is more than just building a shed. Um, I've seen a fair few shed companies around the world that say they can build a perfect barn. Um, I no doubt they can build a perfect shed, but there is more to building a barn than just the shed itself. So um, what does a cow need? Needs access to water. 
It needs um, access to feed, um, adequate ventilation, adequate lighting, long day lighting systems have, have been proven to improve um, uh, milk production and average daily gains of all the way from calves all the way up to, um, to your lactating cows. Um, you want good quality bedding um, and as spoken for, you want protection from the elements. So if if you've ever been on a on a farm, you want to um uh, in a barn, um, you want to build a barn that you're going to be happy to go into because your cows are going to spend a lot of their time in there. So if you don't like it, how do you think they feel? So what impacts barn choices? Um, as sort of spoken before, location and climate is a big part of it. Um, so if you're if you're in a high heat, high humidity climate, a tunnel barn and that sort of stuff might be where you go. A naturally ventilated facility as well is it can be can be um, quite good. Uh, but if you're more so in your sort of sub zeros where you get heavy uh, heavy um, snowfall, places like northern northern uh, USA, Canada, and um, especially in Japan, I've seen those facilities. You might want to be looking to close up. So there are different barns for different um, different scenarios, and I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. Um, barn orientation is a key, is is also a key factor depending on where you go. Like um, east-west barns are typically what you'll be, you, you want to build, especially for naturally ventilated facilities. You want to minimise sunlight coming in um, and wind direction. So wind direction, we always want to, with ventilation, go with the wind. So where is your air moving to? If you're pulling air through a building, what facilities have you got close by? We don't want to be pushing air from a big, from a big uh, barn full of four, five, six, a thousand cows straight into another facility because you're going to create issues further down the chain. Um, available space is a big thing. Um, if you're if you've got a target population her, um, herd, so if you're wanting to fit a thousand cows, have you got the space to do it? Um, and what does that look like in terms of if that's multiple barns? How are you going to lay them out? So. Using a dairy design to lay out your farm is 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 a very is, they're very good to, uh, tools to be able to um, work out where your parlor is, where your feed's going to go, effluent management, all of that is very important because building a barn isn't just about putting cows in a facility. Cows produce a lot of a lot of uh, manure, and that manure's got to go somewhere. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and minimum distances between uh, natural ventilated facilities is is very important. You can't have you can't or you don't, you certainly don't want to have two naturally ventilated facilities side by side. You want to have general rule of thumb, the width of the building is how much space you want to put between the two buildings, but most people sort of 30 odd metres between a naturally ventilated facility and the next one is is perfectly fine. Um, whereas if you go to sort of neutral or tunnel barns, hybrids or, or neutral pressure barns, you can bring those facilities a lot closer together. So if you're limited on space, um, but have a a certain amount of cows you want to fit in there, maybe going towards that, more towards that closed, closed barn where you can have a lot more closer together um, is, is better suited to you. Um, budgeting. So do you build all of it now or do you sort of split it up into phases? And I'll talk about that uh, costings at the end there. Um, but it's not, it's obviously if, you, if you're going to build for a thousand or two thousand or more cows, you're going to have to obviously get those cows. So um, if you don't already have them, so <laughs> excuse me. So does it make sense to build it now, or does it make sense to sort of do it with future expansion in mind, where you build in stages and grow your herd um, and get familiar with your facility as you go? So what um, what barns are there? Um, Obviously, naturally ventilated facilities, these facilities are open on all sides. Um, they'll typically have a one to three or an, or an 18 degree uh, roof pitch um, and they're open down the centre um, for the uh, for air to escape. Now, we do, I do recommend putting a ridge cap on the centre um, and that stops water, uh, rain and sunlight from entering the facility. Uh, your next step is a tunnel barn. So these are closed on three sides. So you'll have an open inlet uh, for air to enter, and then you're closed and you're pulling air through the building and down the other end, out the other end. A hybrid tunnel, which is this, essentially a tunnel barn, but you're pushing air, allowing air to come in throughout the facility as well through forced ventilation. Um, neutral pressure barns where all four sides of the facility is closed and the air you're pushing in is a one-to-one. -one. So air you bring in is the air you're pulling out. 
And then cross ventilated facilities is very much the same as a tunnel, except you're going across the building, not, not up and down it. So naturally ventilated facilities. Um, there are some key considerations that you need to take into account if building this facility. First of all is barn orientation. And I'll talk and I'll share more about that on the next slide. Uh, roof slope, as I said, you want a one to three roof slope and this just allows, um, this allows for the air to be able to come as it warms up, uh, leave, the, leave the facility. It's, it's, it's shown to be the best way to uh, naturally for natural ventilation, a one to three roof pitch gets that air in and out. Um, so you're not sort of, if you've got a flatter roof or a flatter slope, you'll sort of, you'll hold that air and you can get sort of quite humid and and uh, not the nicest conditions. We want to keep that air in that facility fresh. Uh, and then obviously, as I said before, location to other facilities. You don't want to have two tunnel barns side by side because you you want air to come in through all sides. So you need to have adequate um, space that's um, unused beside the building to allow for air to enter without um, without any issues. Uh, what we're then trying to do is um, create an ECV, which is um, pushing, taking that fresh air as you're bringing it into the building, catching it and forcing it down to the cow. Um, air that comes in through the sides or through the ends will come through the facility, raise up and travel up and then out through the top. You need to catch some of that air and actually force it down onto the cow. So as you can see from the picture there, that's what we're doing in this facility. And that just helps, obviously, that obviously helps to dry your bedding, keep your cows lying down for longer, which is um, which is always the goal. So barn orientation is, is, is very important for naturally ventilated facilities. In an ideal world, you want to go east-west. Um, so from the, from the top image, you can see that's a north-south barn. And basically, up until lunchtime, you're going to have sun entering that facility. And then in the afternoon on the flip side, you've got sun entering that facility. So you've got sun on cows for half the day on either side, which if you're already, if you're building a barn, a lot of the time you're trying to get them away from the sun. So uh, having sun enter the facility, you're going to have uh, sun on cows in beds. You'll heat the beds up. You'll, you'll heat the cows up. They're not going to be as comfortable. You'll heat the concrete. Um, so Going in east-west, um, you, you drastically minimise how much sun actually gets into the facility. And that's important for, especially for if you do a six-row facility with a central feed lane, you're going to have a lot of sun, especially on those outside rows. Um, so we want to minimise that as much as possible. So ridge caps certainly help um, and, and eaves. These two images here don't really have an eave. Definitely would recommend putting an eave of two, at least two meters on each side, just to help keep that sun out of the facility. Um, tunnel hybrid and neutral pressure barns. So, as I've spoken before, um, a neutral, uh, a negative pressure barn is basically um, uh, a tunnel and a hybrid where you're pulling air in from one side and um, purely through exhaust fans at the other end. So you're pulling air through the facility. Um, a hybrid will allow, will also have fans down the length of the facility to push air in. Um, and then a neutral pressure barn is, as we said, uh, positive pressure fans at the start with exhaust fans at the end. So the air you push in is equal to the air you move out. So for these facilities, um, anything over 150 meters, you you will sort you will see um, diminishing air quality down the back end of the facility. So that's where sort of a hybrid is a is a good case where you're bringing and mixing fresh air as you go down the facility. And in those facilities, we're obviously trying to create air exchanges through your exhaust fans. So depending on uh, the depending on the time of year. Um, in your colder, your winter months, we're, so, we're looking for usually around four air exchanges an hour. Um, and then as we sort of transition in your shoulder months, you're looking to get sort of 15 to 20. And then by the time you're at summer, you're looking at 40 to 60 air changes an hour, which is um, air from the start, entering to leaving the facility in about a minute, a minute and a half. So it, it is, um, it's, you're moving quite a lot of air in those summer months and that's to keep the air fresh and to keep your cows cool. So here is a just an example of, of those facilities. So this, as we start here, is a what a tunnel barn would look like. You're bringing 
fresh air in from the um, from the inlet on the left there. Um, you're driving that fresh air down through your ECV fans down onto the cows in the beds, uh, and then you're exhausting that air at the other end. Uh, in a hybrid, we're then looking to bring fresh air in throughout the building. So, especially if you've got if you've got longer facilities or if you've got wider facilities, these fans pushing air in will help to keep the air fresh further down the building. And then finally, um, a neutral pressure system where you have fans at the inlet as well as the outlet. So you're, and these can be matched with um, uh, fogging to keep your cows uh, even, even cooler and reduce that barn temperature. Cross fan facilities. Uh, these are almost entirely um, negative pressure systems. Um, we're moving air instead of sideways along the cow, you're moving it from head to tail or tail to head, depending on which way they're laying. Um, and usually you're looking at that um, when you've got a lot of cows under one roof. So you're looking at facilities that are sort of 12 rows or, or wider, usually very wide facilities. You'll be looking at a cross ventilated uh, system here. So issue there is if you do a cross ventilated facility, you go with baffles, air that runs under a baffle will turn around on itself. So you get pockets between baffles uh, where the air quality can be, can be quite, uh, quite low. Um, and if you've ever been in a, in a, and it's the same for a tunnel barn too, if you've been in a tunnel or a cross and you've been in the alleyways with, with baffles uh, over the cows, you'll feel a lot of air movement down through the alleys, which feels great. But once you get into the beds, because of those pinch points, you'll find a lot of that air shoots down alleyways or, or where equipment move because there's um, less resistance to that air traveling through the facility. So what a lot of people or what people are sort of doing what we we do recommend is um entirely removing those baffles it allows for air to travel through that facility um evenly uh and then like we would like we would do with a tunnel barn or, or a naturally ventilated barn uh, we would then try to catch that air and force it down over the cows uh as seen in this image here so here's a here's an example of a uh, of a cross ventilated facility um the inlet is um, usually you'll have a um, curtain system on it and that will open and close based on um, your air exchange rate. So in winter, it'll be, it'll be um, more so closed. And then as you heat up, it'll start to open so that you're equaling the air that's um, uh, being pulled out the other end. Um, as I said, you're trying to shoot that air down over the cows. So um, those ECV fans, as air comes in, air will raise up over the top and those fans will catch that air and push it back down, keep air moving along the floor because obviously we don't have cows up in the ceiling. We have cows down in the beds most of the time and we want to be moving that air down through the beds. Uh, and then much like a tunnel barn, we're exhausting it out the other end. <laughs> now, composting versus free store barns. Um, compost barns usually or a lot of the time, if it's the same, if you're building the same size facility, a compost barn will have a lower upfront cost versus a free store barn, but you will have a higher cost per cow. You'll also have a higher running cost per cow, uh, and you will have a lower number of cows within that same facility. So um, I'll talk a, a little bit about a couple of examples, but it's usually, it comes down to available space. So we want to make sure um, with a with a free store barn, you can fit a lot more animals in. So for the same size facility, your costs are going to be lower per cow because you have more cows. So for a compost barn, like you said, the um, you have a lower capital outlay versus the free store. Um, in Australia, at least, um, we've found 12 square meters to 15. A lot, a lot of them over here are doing 15 square meters, which is a sort of 130 to 160 uh, square feet. Uh, Apologise, I use the metric system. Um, that's that's where you want to be uh, in terms of cow space. So you're not ruining the bedding. You're, you're keeping it nice and dry, and, and and actually composting because if it gets if composting if it gets away from you, it's, it can be very hard to bring it back. So you want to make maintain that uh, bedding as active composting. So by you, and the main thing there is don't overstock. So you want to keep uh, an, an adequate number of cows in there so that you can keep the barn composting and uh, ventilation is, a, is, a, is key in keeping your bedding dry. So I'll talk a little bit about bedding management. Um, you want to be 
um, stirring, but sort of you want to be reaching 20 to sort of 30 centimetres, um, which is about 8 to 12 inches, and that's to get oxygen in, in amongst it because um, composting bacteria um, obviously needs oxygen in order to heat it up. Um, so most people will do a combination of two things. So they'll um, do deep tilling twice a week uh, and then a rototiller um, for the remainder of it. And that's the deep tiller gets down down to 30 centimetres, down to that 12 inches, but it'll sort of bring it out in clumps, whereas the rototiller will um, break it all up and keep it nice and fluffy. Um, you Ideally, we want the compost to be around that 45 to 55 degrees Celsius at 10 to 20. So that's one way you can test how your how healthy your pack is. Uh, another and an, just an easier way is to, to eyeball it is how, how clean are your cows. If you've got cows that look like they've been lying in mud, you probably don't have a compost barn anymore. Um, if it's if it's wet, you're you're looking more at a, a just a, a pack barn. Um, so the other issue there is again, like with a compost barn, uh, it's difficult to accommodate large numbers of animals um, versus a freestall. So the same size facility, you're going to have maybe forty, uh, maybe sixty percent of the animals, 60, 50, 60, 70 percent of the animals that you fit in a freestall, you'd fit in a compost barn, um, and like I said, um, you want to maintain that bedding because mastitis can become a real risk if the, if the um, bedding gets away from you. So proper ventilation is a good way to keep cows spread out. Um, we don't want cows bunching, so ventilation will help cows to spread out um, and also help to keep your, um, your bedding dry. So free stall burning. Um, there, are, there are a number of ways you can do it um, on on the right there, you can see that's a six row center feed and a six row um, perimeter feed. So perimeter feed just being feed lanes on the outside versus a feed lane down the center. Um, you could most, a lot, uh, very common four rows as well. Um, now you can double this up and go 12, uh, 12 rows or tunnel barns, people do that. Um, anything really over 12, 14 rows is when you're gonna start looking at, at that uh, ventilation. Um, so center feeding, um, obviously it's just one central feed lane. Um, the difference here is with a center feed, you're going to have a higher, higher cost for equipment. So as you can see, there is, there's four rows of fans there because we're trying to ventilate um, each row. Um, uh, running costs is not so different because your outside rows, are, those single rows are uh, uh, usually using a one and a half horsepower fan versus your head to heads, which are, um, three horsepower so running cost is usually about the same but you have a much you you will have a higher uh, equipment cost um which then also leads into maintenance which is just something um, to be aware of um there are narrower as well so again if if um not by much but they are narrower so if if that if space is something to be a consideration uh, that that is something you want to take into account uh, so, and then perimeter feeding is, is just basically, as you can see, it's feeding along the outside. So that centre head to head in the middle there would run the full length of the facility and it acts the same. You'll have two pens. You'll have a pen on the left and a pen on the right with that, that centre head, head to head to split either side of the pens. Uh, lower, lower cost versus the um, six row centre feed because you need uh, less fans or all the ventilation is all is the same, keeps it nice for maintenance, um, but it is wider. It, it is it is a wider facility because you do have two um, two feed lanes. Uh, free store recommendations. Um, a lot of this information is on our catalogue. So if uh, if you if you miss this or or want want some more information about free stores, do check out our catalogue. Also, the Dairyland Initiative has a great table which I've got on the next slide. So when thinking about a free stall, this is where you want a cow to spend at least 14 hours of her day, well, 12 to 14 hours of her day, you want her to be spending in the free stall. So you want to make sure that this space is, is comfortable, comfortable for her to, in order to get the maximum lying times out of her. So you want to make sure you've got the proper width, um, the proper uh, uh, the depth, uh, adequate bedding, comfortable bedding, uh, make sure she's lying straight. Um, you don't want diagonal laying. You don't want cows defecating in the beds. So um, 
as you can see from the image there. And um, these are sort of our recommendations on what a free stall um, setup should look like. Um, but don't don't think you need to write any of this down because if you just go to the Dairyland Initiative, they they also have this information, and it's a great great tool to um, see um, if you're if you're looking at a facility. This is depending on your animal size. This is um, these are the figures on how wide and how deep in it you want those bedding, beds to be. This is a typical um, free stall setup. This is our most popular free stall setup, which is a, uh, a twin rail. Uh, we also do a bio rail, which is, um, which is very similar to this. Um, and yeah, as you can see this, uh, you want enough space here. So uh, five point, around 5.2 meters is typically for, a, for an adult Holstein, how, how deep you want those beds so that they've got enough forward lunch space and they're gonna impact the cow in front of them. Typically, they're 1.2 metres wide, gives them enough space, again, without leaning too far into the next stall and not being so wide that they can turn around, lay diagonal. Uh, here is a, just a couple of different options. So we do a floor mount system. Typically, if, if you're looking at a, a mattress setup, floor mounts is, um, is, is quite popular with those. An individual post mount system, these are uh, incredibly sturdy, uh, needs a lot more concreting, obviously, because uh, you have an individual post to loop system. Uh, and then finally, a rail mount system, which is similar to the twin rail, except you have that bottom rail. Now, that's something a twin rail, I would say, is a, a better system than doing this because that bottom rail will impact a cow where she lays where her face is. And if she lunges forward, she'll see that bottom rail. So there are other options available, but it, it, is, a, it is one to consider. Um, feed fronts. So you've got an option between uh, feed rails and headlocks. So with feed rail, uh, it comes down to you've got more space per cow at the feed front there uh, versus a headlock. Um, you will, though, see uh, sort of more displacement from. So dominant cows um, will tend to bully subordinate cows at the feed front, push them out of the way. We'll see less of that with a headlock. Uh, and obviously you cannot you can't work on animals in a barn um, with feed rail. Uh, so if you're already if you've already got that set up in a parlor, a lot of a lot of places in Australia will do a, a feed rail set up because they work their, on their animals in the uh, parlor sort of holding area, working area beside it, so they don't need to in the barn. Um, but if you want to do it in the barn, a uh, headlock headlocks are the way to do it. So. They are allowed to uh, treat cows sort of in a, in in an area that they're comfortable with, that they spend a lot of their time their time in, and um, yeah, so you can do anything from physical examinations, vaccinations, AI, preg checks, and just routine treatment. Um, it's also better for um, uh, uh, feed bunk usage, so cows are less. They're sort of dominant cows are, are going to be less. They will bully cows less, and they reckon it's about um, it's about a twenty percent reduction versus a feed rail in terms of um, competitive behaviour at that feed front. Um, and having cows and having lockups and working on cows in headlocks is it is typically will decrease your labour cost versus um, feed rail and, and working on cows in your um, in the uh, milking parlour. And um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, labor behind feed labor is typically the, the second largest cost. So anything to make your employee's life easier is uh, the, they're uh, usually quite happy about that. Um, here are our recommendations. Again, these this table can be found on our catalog if you want if you want to know more about it. So um, here is based on age groups anyway from three to six three months up to your adult cows. Um, how many uh, in terms of we typically do a three meter section, so these are our sort of breakdowns on um, what the headlock look, look headlock should look like for that age group. Uh, and sort of finally on this point, uh, cow comfort. So once you've decided on if you're going to go compost, if you're going to go free stall, um, what type of free stall, what type of barn you're going to go in terms of six row, four row. Um, if you're, you then want to take into account, obviously, um, cow comfort. So heat abatement is a, is a big part of that. So, and that is creating air velocity. So that's cooling your cows, um, as you can see here, 
what we're targeting is cows spending as much time laying in the beds. So you want to make the beds as comfortable as possible because um, a cow laying down during a cow is a cow that's producing milk. Um, those places that are hot, so in uh, in our part of the world, we, um, we're soaking, especially anything over... 20 degrees Celsius is when we uh, when we start to do soaking soak systems along the feed lane, uh, and that combined with uh, ventilation is the is the fastest way to cool your cow uh, internal body temperature. Um, high pressure fogging, high pressure fogging is very much it's not. I like to say it's not designed to cool the cow. Soaking systems are designed to cool the cow. Fogging systems. Uh, are designed to cool the facility. So think about it as an air conditioning unit in your in your own house. So it'll it'll cool cool your house down, or cool, in this sense, cool the barn down. So I spent a couple of weeks in um, in the Middle East on a on a farm that was uh, every day for two weeks. The farm hit external temperature hit fifty degrees Celsius, which I think is about one twenty to one thirty Fahrenheit. So extremely hot. Um, and with this facility, they were uh, a neutral pressure facility and they had fogging systems on, on the inlet fans, pushing cool air into the facility and then fogging on each of the fans to cool the air as it went down the facility. Um, and they were taking the temperature from 50 degrees Celsius outside to 24, I believe it was inside. So it's a, it was basically cutting 26 degree, temp it was a 26 degree temperature drop from outside to inside from adding fogging. So it certainly has its uses, um, very much so in dry, drier, drier climates. And I we recommend only in um, sort of tunnel, hybrid, new, or neutral or cross vent barns. Um, fogging increases the humidity. Obviously, um, you're adding water to the air. What you're trying to do is get that um, by by cooling it. So by adding humidity, you can make the facility worse. So you want to make sure the trade-off from cooling by adding water and increasing the humidity um, is 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 um, is worth it. So we only fog less than sixty-five percent, um, but we want, only want to do it in a in a and at least a tunnel barn because all that moisture you add to the air, you need to get rid of it out of the facility. So in a in a naturally ventilated facility, you're going to add a lot of humidity, a lot of moisture to the air, but your air exchanges aren't really going to be there so you will sort of drastically increase your um increase your humidity and and we i wouldn't recommend doing it on, on composting either because you'll you'll wet your bedding um obviously if you're building a barn you're um, going to provide shade um, um and so one other thing you can do on top of just the roof is insulation insulation is great at e keeping the barn even cooler than um, just a straight up um a straight up roof um, limiting stocking density, as we spoke for compost, you don't you don't want to have too many cows. You, you'll it'll be very hard to maintain that bedding. Um, and then also in free store barns, you've only got a certain amount of um, bedding. So if you run more than more cows than you have beds, you're going to have cows laying in places you don't want them to lay. Um, as we spoke earlier, adequate clean water, dump your troughs, keep your water clean. Um, you want air, uniform airflow that's moving air throughout the facility, air not turning around and doing circles. You want to keep that air like a wave moving through the facility and moving over your animals. And obviously we're targeting uh, minimum air speed. So in my part of the world, it's quite hot and humid. We're really trying to target at least at least two metres per second, ideally three metres per second on average of air speed. Um, uh, and that's in, in your summer months, in your high heat. So there are different versions of ventilation. Uh, we do blast breeze fans. Um, you'll see a lot of a lot of these around the world. Um, great for feed lanes. Um, don't re so much recommend them for uh, head to heads. Oh, oh sorry, we're over the bedding. Um, typically, you'll need a lot more, have them a lot closer together because um, as you can see from the image there, the area of, of effect is is far less than what you'll get out of an ECV fan. So they need to be brought closer together. Um, the air is also comes out quite turbulent. So with an um with these fans, it'll run, it'll hit, and it'll break up quicker versus a, a louvered fan. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh so why would you use an ECV fan? So 
you'll typically, you will get a longer run of air. Um, you, you'll also get air reaching the floor faster than a um, blast fan. So the idea of the louvers there is we're targeting, as we can see here, each louver until the idea being just before the base of the next fan. So that air, as it runs down from that first louver, it'll hit, it'll run, and it'll want to then uh, rise up and get away and get up into that clean air space. And then you have that second wave of air come over the top and force it back down. So what we're doing is trying to move, move, have that air, uh, air focused in the sort of 30 a foot off the bed kind of area because we that's where we want that cow to be if we if a cow walks in and has a lot of air up, moving up around her face she's going to spend more time standing up but if you can get that air down and moving at ground level she's going to um, she'll be incentivized to lay down earlier and spend more time laying down and it won't matter if she's lying directly under the fan or 10 12 meters away from the fan uh, she's getting the benefit uh, at each at each stage Fogging, I, I did spend a lot of time talking about this before. Um, so you can put them on, um, mainly they're put on ECV fans, so to cool that air as it comes down onto the cow. Um, but also on inlet fans is, is great. So as you force air into a facility, you're cooling the air as it comes into the building. Again, wouldn't do it for a uh, naturally ventilated facility or, or I wouldn't put it on ECV fans over, over compost bedding. Um, as you'll, you'll wet the bedding. Um, now, obviously, these the idea is that they snap, evaporate. So you need to have fil you need to filter that water uh, quite extensively. You don't want hard water, otherwise you'll just be constantly replacing nozzles. Um, <laughs> and again, the idea is for fogging is is to cool the facility, uh, which in turn will cool the cab. But the main purpose of a fogging system is to cool the building, uh, building first. So taking those extreme those high heat um high heat low humidity uh and lowering the heat substantially but it will increase the humidity which is why we don't want we don't run fogging systems over 65 percent th uh over 65 percent humidity we won't run a fogging system so if you're in sort of like i've been to a lot of places in, in uh, southeast asia and they ask like it's it's high heat uh, but it is high humidity and we've we've got a tool where we can take a weather station and work out how of the of the percentage of the year where you would fog how um how much time would you actually fog given the humidity and it's a lot of the time it's too humid in in asia for it to um to, for it to be a benefit uh whereas if you go to places more so like australia we have high heat low humidity um and places like the middle east I'm not so sure about the US, but I'm assuming the sort of California might be a good place for it where hot heat, low humidity. That's where you want to have fogging systems. Um, feed lane soaking. So feed lane soaking systems uh, don't have that issue. You're you're soaking the cow uh, to a skin and we use it in in any any humidity. You're just you're adding water, you're not so much adding humidity, you'll add a little bit, but it's not enough to be worried about. So we use it. Anywhere in the world that you're spending a considerable amount of time over 20 degrees and you're seeing cows uh, impacted by heat stress, um, a feed lane soaking system is, is what you want to do to be able to, to cool that cow. And here in Australia, we'll promote a, a feed lane soaking system. So when that cow goes to feed or she's, she's hot, she goes to the feed front, she gets soaked down to her skin. Um, she'll know with the ventilation behind her, she's not going to spend all day standing at the feed lane getting soaked. She knows if I get soaked and I go back to the bed, um, I'll have a fan there. And that's where you really cool the cow. It's a combination of wetting her and then drying her off. So the drying part is the, is the, um, is, is important because you know, it's, I like say people imagine if you're, you jump into a pool and you get out of the pool, um, you're wet, you're going to be cooler. Um, but once, if you ever, if you ever been in the ocean or a pool and you step out and you get a breeze over you, that's when you really feel the uh, the impact. So that's what we want to combine feed lane soaking with ventilation, and it's it is the fastest way uh, to cool a cow, bring her out of heat stress. Um, we do stage it. So at twenty degrees, we're not super aggressive with soaking. You might be one minute off, and then anywhere from ten to fifteen minutes. Of, um, uh, sorry, one minute on and then 10 to 15 minutes off. And then as you progressively get hotter, um, you bring those soaking stages closer together so you can be more aggressive the hotter it gets. And that's good for if you've got uh, water limitations, um, you're not 
you're not over soaking your cow when you don't need to. And we'll also we'll typically um, space those soaker nozzles anywhere from 1.8 to two meters, which I think is about six six to seven feet apart uh, to get to get good coverage. Here's um, some examples of of it not quite done right. So um, on the left there, uh, those uh, this it was some plastic stalls. Um, you can see the cow because because they're um, they're quite flimsy. Those cows will push the stall. So you've got two cows who are laying diagonally because they've got the option to walk in, turn and lay across the bed. So you'll see cows defecating in the beds, which you don't want, um, which then impacts that one cow in the centre there who uh, is going to sp spend more time standing because she doesn't have the adequate space to lay down into. Um, these guys are using mattresses. Um, it's 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 okay as long as I we do recommend at least putting some bedding on top of the mattress. You want it like mattresses can be quite hard. If you're going to go down the mattress route, put um, put some bedding, additional bedding on top, maybe four to six inches of of compost or or, or, or whatever it is that you put on top, just to make it that little bit um, that little bit softer for her. Um, this center one is a a runner to compost barn, but as you can see, they're only they haven't got enough ventilation. Those cows are all lying down the center there. If you're going to build a facility of that size. You want the cows to utilize all of the space available. Um, it's kind of a catch twenty two. If you don't put enough ventilation in, you only one run one run one line. You'll find all your cows will congregate under that one line, and the rest of your bedding is underutilized. So you've got nice bedding on the outside, but where the fans are, where you're trying to use to uh, dry your bedding, all your cows are there. So you've got a lot more um, usage. You'll have uh, more obviously cows will defecate and urinate and you get a, you get worse pack even though you're promoting a cattle lie there so you want to make sure that they spread out you want to have proper ventilation get them to spread out use all the space available and the one there on the far right is obviously a, a pack that's gone too far so that's no longer composting and that's you can't see it you probably can't see it really well but that fan on the left there isn't running and the fan on the right is and you can see where all those cows are laying they're all spending their time on the right there we want to use all the ventilation available uh, to use all of that space available, um, and it's you want to use adequate ventilation. These fans aren't enough, um, uh, aren't doing enough of a job to keep that bedding dry and keep those cows um, spread out. So finally, um, you've uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, you you now know what you want to build. So I'm going to talk now about different ways of building. Uh, do you build a, a complete facility straight up? Do you phase it? What do the costings look like there? Um, I do recommend if you're going to build a facility, always keep in mind about building future facilities. You you may not have, you might be like, no, I'm, I'm one and done, but maybe your kids might expand it. Maybe um, one day you were looking to get out of the game. Having that future expansion in mind is, is, is um, it's something, something to think about. Um, not, not so for, much for yourself in some cases, but for future generations. Um, who is it? Uh, Jake Martin always has. Uh, I remember him saying, "There's there's three things um, that's uh, inevitable. Oh, there's three things that are certain in this world: that's death, taxes, and dairies expand. And you may not think it, but once you sort of get down this route, we've seen, especially in Australia, guys that were built have built one barn, and it's as soon as that first facility that first facility's up, they've got cows in there. They're they're now already looking at barn two and barn three, and they wouldn't have thought about that uh, without speaking to a dairy designer. Um, very important, keep effluent in mind. Um, there's the building a barn in, in itself, but cows do produce a lot of manure as, as spoken. So that needs to go somewhere. So you need to take into account um, where, where that's going to go, which is why using, again, using a dairy designer is, is great in terms of, um, of, in terms of barn layouts and then where your feed's going to go, where your manure is going to go. Um, if you're, if you're bedding with sand, you need to separate that sand. You need, separate, you need separation from um, manure, your water and manure. So there's a there's a lot more to a facility than just the barn that needs to be taken into, into account. And then obviously the proximity to other facilities. So looking at a four row freestyle barn, uh, I'll, I just want to make one thing uh, clear. This, these figures are all in uh, Australian dollars. Uh, they include freight. They include uh, uh, over 
uh, sorry, freight overseas, freight over land, uh, installation costs, and most importantly, exchange rates. So what you see here is um, you, it might not be what you would see uh, depending on where you are in the world, but these are more figures just to help you understand the differences between phase building or building in, uh, building uh, compost versus free soil. So I just want to make that clear. So all these figures are in Australian dollars. So some of them, it might look quite high to you if you're in the US because uh, obviously your exchange rate is much better than, well, you get a, it's much better than what we get here. So looking at a four row, and this is just a 276 cow um, four row free stall. So if you were to build that full facility, um, the main point here is, and don't don't get too caught up on the 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 total cost. Um, that one there being two million, it's the cost per cow, which which is um, which really is how it's going to work back to. Because um, if you are looking for finance, you go to a, a bank. This is how you can break it down for them um, to be more manageable about this is the cost per cow. This is how how my return investment is going to work in terms of paying it off. So building the facility itself, the facility. Um, <clears throat> the facility is half the cost. So, and that's not just building the shed, concreting, especially in Australia, uh, con building uh, feed lanes, cow alleys, crossovers, concreting is, is quite expensive. So that is something to take in, into account. It's not just the barn, it's the, it's the concrete that goes into it. Um, and then ventilation and your steel systems on top of that, and then effluent systems. So um, for this facility here, uh, we're, we're looking at about seven and a half thousand dollars per animal at 276 head. Now, if we were to split that, oh, sorry, I'll go back up. So if you can look here, there's phase one and phase two, left and right. So if you were to split that facility in half, um, your first phase, uh, no matter if, if you're gonna build any facility, your first phase is always the, like, or your first barn is always the most expensive barn. Uh, and that's because you're going to build the manure uh, equipment, uh, the manure separation and all that, all that. Um, storage and sand separation and all all of that in phase one. And if you're designing a facility for four barns, but you're only going to build one barn for phase one, you're still going to build an effluent system for all four barns uh, versus just one and then having to expand, expand. It's much, much easier to just to do the effluent system in phase one and then every barn after that or every phase after that is is, is much cheaper. So Versus phase one here, you can see the cost per cow to build the to build half the barn, half the ventilation system, half the free stalls. Uh, but to build the full manure system, your 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 cost per cow is 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 much higher at nine and a half thousand per animal. But then for phase two, all you're doing is adding that extra extra barn length. So you're just adding the extra roof, the concreting, and the extra ventilation and steel systems. And to do that is is about half the cost, so about five thousand per cow to to make that extension. So again, if you're if um, finance is something you're looking at and you can only lend a certain amount, this is how you can break it down and go. This is what it's going to cost to do phase one, and then every phase after that should be cheaper. Now, compost to free soil conversions. We're not. Uh, you, you don't have to build a free soil barn. You might not want to build a free soil barn. But you should um, always keep in mind conversions to comp from compost to free source. We've got a couple here in Australia that have built compost barns, <laughs> either haven't quite worked out or they're now in a position that they want to go to a free stall. Um, you want to make sure that you've designed a facility or your whoever your des designer is has designed a facility that if you are doing compost, um, you can you can go to free stall relatively uh, relatively easily. So here's an example of um, what that compost barn would look like as a cross section. So you could build that, but it wouldn't be too hard for that to go to that. And you're utilize your uh, in terms of space. That's efficient. It's efficient. You're not. You don't have. Um, you don't have. You haven't built a barn that's wider than it needs to be, and you're, <clears throat> the space is all is is entirely utilized. So again, going from something like that, which and a lot of people just want to build a compost barn in Australia, especially people who are transitioning from pasture want to transition into compost because it's it's similar to what they've done before cows and in pasture cows on compost um but like we say dairies expand um and a, an easy way to expand is from compost to free soil you've you've already built a facility um <clears throat> you can in in some cases almost double your your herd 
um, just and within the same building. So all you're doing is adding adding the steel. So to do that, <laughs> excuse me, um, here is a, a compost barn, which is a, a, a five. It's designed for 500 cows. And then this is it, it. This is the same facility in mind with a with a free store conversion that's from 500 cows at 15 square meters per cow. So it's quite a lot of space per cow. Um, and then the free store version is uh, just under 1,100 cows. I think it's 1,092. So you can see that this facility itself, um, you've more than doubled the amount of cows for the same amount of space. So what does that look like if you were to build one or build the other? Um, as stated earlier in this piece, building a compost barn is it's it's a cheaper upfront cost, um, but it is a higher cost per cow, um, and it's and I'll I'll speak a little bit in in a few slides about it. It's also a higher running cost. <clears throat> so across the two, the the facility itself costs the same. So the shed, the concreting, either way, it's still the same. It's the same barn. The cost per cow is obviously different because you've got more than twice the amount of cows in the free stall versus the compost barn. Um, your ventilation systems for a compost barn are going to be more expensive because than a free stall, um, and that's typically go back up here. That's typically because you will have more fans for a compost barn versus a free stall barn. And the example above was actually designed uh, initially designed with the from the design himself with four rows of fans, but given um, the high the high um, uh, space available for the for the cows, we've reduced it to three rows. So the fan numbers are relatively even, um, but there are still more fans for compost because we need to cover all of the, we want to be covering all of the bedding available. If you were to just run a single row of fans down that centre, you would have all 500 cows lie down that centre. If you didn't have that centre row, you'd see them split two rows either side. So... By having three rows there, we're trying to promote using all of the available space. Um, but it just means there are more fans for less cows versus a free stall. So in terms of cost, <clears throat> the um, compost barn works out to be about a million dollars cheaper, which is a considerable considerable amount of money. Um, so, but the cost per cow is obviously is obviously um, much higher. So we're looking at just under 9,000 cost per cow for a free uh, compost versus under 5,000 for the uh, for the free stall. And that's it's just mapped down to the amount of cows within that facility. Now, <clears throat> if you were to build that compost barn first, and we've we've sort of spoken before, you can go from compost to free stall. How, how does that then look out? So you that compost barn is still that the same figures as above. Uh, four six, but then the conversion uh, to go across is in terms of cow numbers is um, is quite cheap. So this cost here isn't uh, the cows on the sorry the the table on the right isn't for a thousand. It's for the additional five hundred ninety two cows you can get in that facility. So it's a, it's it is more expensive to build a compost plant and then do the conversion to a free store, and that's um, that's because you're going to have to refit the fans. Um, uh, you're going to have to add all the steel. So there are some labor costs. You need to put your cow somewhere during that time as well. Um, so it works out. I think it's about it's about $400,000, $500,000 more expensive um, uh, to do the... Oh, sorry, no, no, it's not that much. It's 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 going to be a little bit more expensive to do the conversion because you've got to send your electrician back in to, to refit, move fans and all that sort of stuff. So um, your cost, your cost, but your cost per cow is, is only... 2400 so you if you're doing it in phases and like i said if you if you want to go compost always keep in mind that from compost you can go free stall and what does that design look like so utilize this uh, this space uh and then sort of getting now finally into uh running costs so for this facility we're saying it's in northern victoria here so this is what their um this is what their local climate uh, looks like I've taken the Bureau of Meteorology's uh, weather data for the last ten years, ran it through a um, ran it through our calculator, and this is what the sort of temperature looks like. So they're looking at about twenty eight percent of the year they're over that um, over that sixty five thi, uh, and then from there we can plug in our fans and see what that running cost would look like. So on the top there for the pack barn. Um, Assuming 500 cows, assuming uh, the electric electricity costs are 25 cents 
uh, per kilowatt per hour um, using uh, litres and assuming a 60 cent milk price. That's actually quite low. The milk price in Australia has, has come up a bit since then. Uh, we can see there that the costs per cow per day is about 75 cents on average per cost per cow per day, which if you're getting paid 60 cents a litre, um, the cost to run that ventilation system for the compost barn is about 1.3 litres per cow per day. Um, again, milk price is a bit better at the moment, so we'd assume that um, that to be a, a, that additional milk required to be less. Um, now versus that free store barn, so a little bit less, uh, there are uh, less fans in there. Um, so the, the overall running cost is less, um, but because of the, um, and it's the, it's the same inputs we're using before, but just be, because you've got an extra 600 uh, odd cows, um, the cost per cow per day is, is, uh, is much less. You're down at 25 cents cost per cow per day because you have, you have that many more cows. So you can spread that cost over a larger herd. And that means you're now looking at about 0.4 of a litre um, to, to run that system. So, yeah, as we said, as I said earlier, like a compost mine, a compost mine is cheaper to build, um, but it has a higher uh, cost of, um, higher, higher cost of equipment for ventilation, and it also has a higher running cost um, per cow. So th those are things to take in mind if you're looking at one or the other. So, um, yeah, finally, um, we all, all barns are different. Uh, we look at each each design. We we will take we tailor ventilation layouts and free stalls and stuff based around the facility you have in mind that you're de uh, build, designing or building, and we we will optimize your um, sort of ventilation layouts and everything based off those designs you um, you share with us. Um, so yeah, that is it. Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any questions, Annie? Thank you so much, Henry. Yes, we have a couple of questions that came in, um, and I know we've just got a couple minutes left to the presentation. Um, one question that came in was that someone recently inherited their family farm and are a little overwhelmed with the amount of updates that are needed. Do you recommend they tackle the parlor or the lying area first? What would make the biggest impact in terms of a, a small investment, um, but again, having that bigger impact? Yeah, um, for a small a small investment, as as I'm just I'm going to assume you've got a uh, obviously a parlor, but also a barn. Um, for a small investment, uh, and um, a, the, the first thing you should always do. Um, fortunately, it wasn't part of my slides, but um, milking parlors, uh, holding yards. Your cows are going to spend a lot of time in a holding yard, and that is um, that's where your highest congregation density of cows are going to be. So. Uh, in an ideal world, you, you're getting cows through a parlor and in an ideal world, 45 minutes, but that's a lot of time you have in the ability to cool your animals all in one place over over, over a long enough period. Um, so for a smaller investment, a holding yard soaking and holding yard ventilation system is the way to go. Um, especially if you don't, if you don't already do that, you can find because of, because you have such a high density of animals in such a small place, um, internal body temperatures, and there's a lot of studies you can uh, you can look at this where uh, internal body temperature will peak in holding yards, and it'll take a long time for them to come down. And that's just because of such close contact with other animals, the the surface their a cow's surface area available to cool themselves is diminished because they're they're only really got their shoulders and above to get rid of that radiant heat. So by cooling them in the holding yard and soaking them in the holding yard is a great place to start. Where and every every barn should, every sorry dairy should start at the holding yard at, at cooling animals. So, and it's a, a lot less a lot less ventilation and so it's a smaller investment to to do it. Perfect. And obviously, you're in Australia, and you mentioned that barns are becoming a lot more popular. What barn yeah. types are you seeing the most of going up, and why is that? Um, almost entirely naturated, naturally ventilated facilities. Um, so electricity is pretty expensive in Australia. So a tunnel barn uses a lot more fans. Um, there are a couple of tunnel barns in Australia. They do, they do very well. Um, the absolute vast majority, 90 plus percent are naturally ventilated facilities where sort of, if you're, depending on what region you are in Australia, Australia's dairy region, like if you're looking sort of 
uh, northern Victoria, Gippsland, that area, <clears throat> you've got a, it's quite a nice dairy environment for, <clears throat> excuse me, most of the year. So we don't have high snowfalls like in, uh, in places in Japan and in, and set in sort of uh, Northern America where you have such high snowfall, dairies are forced to close those facilities. Uh, so you're not sort of freezing, in, freezing the barn. So whereas in Australia, our, most of the time, our temperature ranges from minus five really at the lowest in a lot of places up to 40 degrees, which is quite hot. But um, in those places where you're, where you're building a, a shed, ventilation and cooling systems, a naturally ventilated system is, 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 the, is cheaper and it's, it's the easiest way, easiest way to go, especially if you're, if you're new to buying. Perfect. Well, we are right at the end of time. So thank you so much, Henry. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, and before everyone else goes, Henry, if you want to go to the next slide, um, we just want to invite everyone to our next webinar, which will be on Thursday, November 9th at 11 a.m. Central Time with our own Dr. Mike Wolf. He'll be speaking on, don't forget about ventilation in the off season. Um, so thank you again, everyone, and I hope you have a good rest of your day.